our speaker tonight is Dr. Robin Catchpole. Robin is an astronomer. He's the sort of astronomer who still builds instruments to look at what we've got in the sky, and he still has time to appear on TV and talk shows and the radio. Tonight, um, we're going to hear not only whether there might be life out there, but also whether there might be complex life out there. So over to you, Robin. Okay, the question, is there life, and in particular conscious life, elsewhere in the universe, is probably a question all of us have asked at some time in our lives. So I think the first thing I have to do is to define what is life. And this is a wonderful cop-out explanation of what is life, a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And we could spend a long time debating what we mean about that, but I think we all have an intuition of what we mean about it. So let's pass over that and move on to the question of um, what do we mean by life, having defined what life is. And clearly there is a hierarchy of life. We have single-celled organisms like bacteria. We have multi-celled organisms and, ah, now this is supposed to show on the Zoom, but it doesn't, so let's just see. Ah, oh, I do it over here. Single-celled organisms, and we have multi-celled organisms like jellyfish, and then we get to the more complex multi-celled organisms where the issue of consciousness and self-awareness comes in. And this, of course, is another huge pitfall in this discussion of life. Where does this emerge? How and why does it emerge? And I think we're still a long way from answering that question. And then we get to this self-aware communicating um, life. And I've used a Greek civilization to epitomize this. And of course, there are many, many provisos in a talk like this. One of the provisos is that if the universe was filled with civilizations at this level of advancement, um, we would know nothing about them and we would have no way of communicating with them. So when it comes to um, intelligent communicating life, it clearly, at least in my opinion, has to be technologically advanced, capable of sending and receiving um, signals. But can we be certain to recognize life? Now, I'm afraid this is the only picture of an alien you're going to see in this talk, if some of you have come along with that object in mind. And we have to remember, and one of the many, many provisos, as I said, is that life might not be based on water and carbon. It might use different solvents. It might use silicon. Think silicon rubber. Don't think um, silicates the rocks. And perhaps most importantly, its time scale of operation might be quite different to ours. Uh, you might say that the instant of consciousness is a tenth of a second or so for human beings. So things that vary on time scales of seconds and minutes are things that we are aware of. But if there was a civilization that either operated at very, very much higher frequencies or, on its, or had a heartbeat of once every hundred years or so, when it was communicating, it might operate at such a different level, we would never recognize it. So just one of the um, many provisos. Now, life on Earth is widespread and tenacious. And this is something we've also come to realize in the last, um, well, 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 years or so. And all these environments, Lake Mono here has a very high level of natural arsenic. All these environments have living organisms. Uh, admittedly, there are archaea, which is um, perhaps to be distinguished between um, the archaea and the bacteria and the um, um, eukaryotes, but um, they are nevertheless organisms that would have had a common ancestor to all of us. Here we have Colwellia um, at temperatures of minus 20 or so. It is found to be living and there is evidence of it surviving in ice for 100,000 years or so and some possible evidence that it might still be living and not just uh, in, 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 in an uh, in, 
hibernation at temperatures of minus 40 or so, and perhaps even as may survive liquid nitrogen temperatures um, minus 198. We also find um, uh, bacteria, these bacteria, or, or archaea, I should rather say, uh, living around these, um, these vents where the temperature exceeds that of boiling water, temperatures at which we normally sterilize things. And of course, we find that much of the color we see in environments here uh, is due to um, act, uh, bacterial activity. And there is here, what I have is an image taken from a deep mine in South Africa where we see uh, water spouting out of the rock. This water turns out to be um, not in this mine, but in mines found in Canada, up to 2,000 million years old. And this water has found it's highly saline. Um, it has a lot of free hydrogen in it, and it is rich. Well, not rich, but it contains living organisms. And perhaps the record for the oldest uh, living organisms are found in this 250-year-old salt crystal where we have these brine inclusions. There we are, the brine inclusion here that um, ha was found to contain viable uh, bacteria that were capable of, of or archaeo bacteria, or I should say archaea, I think, to be more modern, um, that were still viable in this ancient rock. So what do we learn? We learn that life on Earth is incredibly tenacious, and there is nothing that human beings could do to eradicate all life on Earth, which may be a consolation to you. We could destroy every living blade of grass, every animal, and um, the Earth would still be full of bacteria and other organisms, single-celled organisms, as deep as three kilometers deep inside, uh, below the surface in the rocks. We live in a universe that is perfectly tuned to our existence. And what does that mean? It means that the laws and constants of nature um, seem to have values that permit us to um, live within this universe. And one of those um, uh, relationships between these constants is the ratio, say, between two protons or so to charged bodies, the relative strength of the force of gravity to the electrostatic force. You can see gravity is extremely weak. And if we were to change this fine tuning very, very slightly, then either the universe, if we increase the force of gravity, the universe would have all collapsed into black holes very early on. If we make the force of gravity a bit weaker, then um, stars and galaxies, stars never form, stellar evolution never goes, nothing ever appears, no structure appears. So, and there are a number of other of these things that fine tune our universe. So why is this? Is there some as yet undiscovered super theory? Is it because the true nature of the universe is the multiverse and we just happen to live in a universe that is naturally, we wouldn't be here if th that, this particular universe wasn't fine tuned or is it, and this is where one's uh, spiritual and religious beliefs come in, is this uh, something to do uh, with uh, some kind of a creator? Now we live in a galaxy of 100,000 million stars and we live in an observable universe and I say observable because the true universe must, might be a lot bigger, and this is the Hubble Deep Field, some of you may recognize. And from this, we can count the number of galaxies in the observable universe, and it turns out to be, um, again, the order of 100,000 million. So there are 100,000 million stars in a galaxy, galaxies in the observable universe, so 10 to the power 22 um, stars in the observable universe. And just to put us human beings back into the, the same uh, sort of argument, the same scale, I would say neurons in the human brain, there are about 80,000 um, million, near enough 100,000 million. What's the difference between stars in a galaxy and neurons in the human brain? In the human brain, they are in, interconnected in a way that allows an enormous amount of complexity. 
So, there are an awful lot of stars around, but I think if we're going to be realistic about considering life and intelligent life, we'll definitely have to confine ourselves to our own galaxy. So, while we're looking at galaxies, here is um, an enlargement of the one we just looked at, and amongst those 100,000 million stars that form the great haze there, we see these, oops, I'm supposed to use the pointer, aren't I? Not use my fingers. We see these, these red regions and these dark regions. These are places where there are giant molecular clouds. And here is such a giant molecular cloud, a place where stars are being born. The molecular cloud extends all round. It's called a molecular cloud because it's rich in molecules. And here is a table of molecules found in, galaxy, uh, in, um, in open space, in space, and within objects within the solar system, like uh, uh, comets and so on. And you're not really supposed to read the table. You're just supposed to be in awe of the table um, to see how many entries there are. And I checked. This is an old version of the table. Um, I think there are 140 molecules here. Um, there are now about 160 known. And amongst those are some really quite interesting ones. Um, let us look at the, um, the one in, the, in the, the top right here. This is hexamethyl tetramine, and you'll see it's got 22 atoms. It's called HMT. It's been recently identified in carbonaceous chondrites. And why is this important? It's a fairly, it's quite rare, but it's a stable molecule. So it can exist within the inner part of the solar system. And it is a precursor of important molecules like formaldehyde um, um, and ammonia, um, and which are Im important prebiotic uh, um, uh, molecules for prebiotic chemistry. And then in blue here, we see, um, well, there's comet 67P and a mass spect spectrometer that sampled material from the coma of this comet was able to detect glycine and uh, the two materials which are, are um, meth methylamine and ethylamine that are the building blocks of glycine. And glycine is the simplest of the uh, amino acids and, Im and an important building block of life. So we are seeing amongst these molecules the basic building blocks of life. So the universe is full of the basic building blocks of life. Now, one of the other things, and we had a lecture from uh, uh, a, a, a few um, no, weeks, months ago, on this topic of detecting exoplanets by uh, Didier Kellos. And um, this is something we now know of over 5,000 um, exoplanets, that's planets around other stars. And there are two ways of detecting them. Basically, the, the way, the pioneering way, is we can't see the planet itself except, oh, I must use the pointer, except for very rare examples, um, there's the pointer, um, where we can actually observe the planet. But what we can observe is the motion of the star about its center of gravity as the planet and the star orbit about their common center of gravity. So we measure the radial velocities, it's called the line of sight motion, seeing how the wavelength of light changes. It becomes more red shifted when it moves away, blue shifted as it moves towards us. And one thing is very obvious, that if we have a massive star around a, uh, a, a, a sorry, a massive planet around a relatively low mass star, then it'll be much easier to detect um, this particular motion, this radial velocity motion. And this is one way of finding exoplanets. Now, I thought what's quite interesting is to just look at this diagram, and let me explain what we're looking at here. We are looking at the motion of the, um, well, 
it's actually the motion of the barrier center of the solar system about the sun. But think of this, the sun, of course, is, a pl is feeling mainly the pull of Jupiter, and so the sun also moves around the common center of gravity of the, um, of the, the um, solar system. And since between 1945 and I think 1995, somewhere in here, 90, this is, if you like, the movement of the sun around the barrier center. And, and you can see that often the point around which the sun is moving is outside the, um, the surface of the sun. So this amounts to an average, if I work out in uh, 45 to now, 50 years, how long, what is the average speed it would travel to travel this distance in 50 years? And it's about um, uh, 1.4 meters a second or 50 kilometers an hour. So in other words, for some other civilization, it would be observing this motion, if you like, through uh, the changes of velocity, and it would deduce the presence of the planets in our solar system. So this, and since this society is about the application of, of technology and so on, this requires very, very sophisticated uh, spectrographs. And um, here we see one called the Harps. There are two Harps and Espresso. I don't know if other sciences are like this, but we're always trying to find acronyms. Harps, High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher, and Espresso, which is pretty... Uh, it, you know, pathetic in a way, Echelle Spectrograph, SP, for rocky exoplanets and stable spectroscopic observations. So you see, you have to make it up so you get a nice acronym. Anyway, these are both essentially work the same way. They, this is an Echelle grating, uh, which is about 84 centimeters long and about 25 centimeters wide, and that means it has grooves ruled on it at, I think, 30 um, to the uh, millimeter, and it's, it's blazed, so you shine light at a very steep angle, and it creates a very, high, um, a, a very highly dispersed spectrum. In fact, it creates about uh, 20 or so overlapping orders of spectra. And this whole thing is mounted in a vacuum, and it is, uh, the temperature is controlled, and it is fed by two fibers. A fiber comes from the focus of the telescope to the spectrograph to illuminate the, the collimator. The fiber, uh, uh, the light comes in here and illuminates the collimator, which shines on the grating, and then we have two cameras um, that record the spectra. And we also simultaneously have to feed in a calibration spectrum. Um, light, uh, thorium is something that's used, although there are other techniques. Now, this HARPS currently achieves a mere 97 centimeters per second, or about three and a half kilometers per hour, which is kind of a, a, a briskish walk. So it could be measuring me walking backwards and forwards if I had a light, and that was detecting the light. So that's, you know, a thousand millionths of the speed of light that I'm walking. What the aim of Espresso is to achieve a, um, a speed of about 10 centimeters per second. So that's like my finger moving here. And this is the way that we hope to detect Earth-like planets around other stars. So let's look at the results from uh, this radial velocity work. And what we see here is a very, um, we see oh, 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 patches of stars here. And we see, I've drawn a line here, which is a kind of observational selection effect. And this plots distance uh, of the planet from the sun. So there's one astronomical unit. There's the Earth. In fact, there's Mercury, Venus, Earth. Mars, Jupiter up there, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and the planet mass in terms of Earth mass is up here. 
So you will see that we're really only, as far as our solar system goes, able to detect um, Jupiters um, around other stars. That uh, These um, planets in here are all moving at speeds that are too low um, to be um, measured by the existing equipment. So what we hope to do by going to 10 centimeters is to pull this diagonal line down below um, these planets here. So that is one way of detecting exoplanets. The other way is by staring at a region of sky and looking for dips of one part in 10,000 as the planet passes in front of its star. And um, you'll see uh, uh, illustrations of this. This, of course, only works if the planetary system is more or less in the plane or, that we are looking at. And this um, was called Kepler. It ran for about four years or so, observed 100,000 stars continuously, produced wonderful light curves, and um, as we will see, we detected um, a number of planets um, using uh, this method. And this is to be replaced, or rather, sorry, not, well, replaced because Kepler broke down about three or four years ago, and um, it is going to be replaced by this satellite called Plato, uh, which is due for launch in 2026. You'll see it has 26 cameras, each is a 12-inch, um, has a 12-inch lens on the front of it, and they're looking at overlapping bits of sky. They're going to look at over a 1,000 square degrees of sky. Um, every 25 seconds, they're going to observe that 1,000 square degrees, and that is going to go on for six years. And by studying, by getting this enormous amount of data, we will be able to see light curves, and we'll be able to pick up transiting planets, as they're called. So the state of play, essentially, um, radial velocity, which we uh, measured here, um, you will see in the blue, which is lost here, but you will see that the transiting um, planets um, also correspond to mainly things that are more massive than the Earth. Um, they're like miniature Ur uh, Uranus and Neptune, those sort of planets, rocky, we think, and or, or maybe rocky with um, uh, big ice cores, uh, we're not quite sure. But what we see here is another observational limit um, by this vertical line. And the problem was the, the, um, the, the Tycho satellite did not last long, uh, Kepler did not last long enough for it to get statistically significant observations of uh, planets that had periods greater than a year. This limit up here was, is about 30 years for the uh, radial velocity work. So you can see that we're still looking at um, problems of observational bias. Now, one of the exciting things is that if you can measure both the radius and the mass, you get the mass from the radial velocity, you get the radius from the width of the object, and for some of the stars, um, for all the ones in this diagram here, you have both. You can start to plot, um, oh, I must use the, uh, the pointer, um, you can start to plot the planet radius up here in terms of Earth radii against the planet mass along here, and you can see that this it corresponds to density. So this line here shows where objects made of pure hydrogen would lie, and you'll see the curves turn over. It's because the equation of state, when you get a lot of mass, you start squeezing the cores, and you can see water, rock, and iron. And here is the Earth between rock and iron down here, and you can see uh, Jupiter is up here, and Saturn and Jupiter are up here with we're close to the hydrogen line, and the, the Uranus and uh, Neptune are down here um, somewhere with a lot more water, we think, in their core. So this is the exciting thing. Of course, you can see there are still very large error bars in this, but we are beginning, getting to the point where we're beginning to able to say what the nature of some of these objects are. So I think I've made a, a, a good case for life being widespread in the universe. The universe is perfectly designed for life. It's full of the building blocks. There are many stars. 
there are many planets and life on Earth is tenacious. So you might say we haven't really come very far in the last 2,400 years because Metrodorus of Chios said, or this is one way of translating what he said, it goes against nature in a large field to grow only one shaft of wheat and in the infinite universe only one living world. What he was saying was it just seems totally ridiculous that we've got all these stars, all this stuff, and only one um, you know, place with life on it and place with civilization. But just because something seems reasonable doesn't mean it's true. And the problem is, of course, that we live in a, we have a problem with statistics, that we have only one example of a technologically advanced civilization, which I think is beautifully epitomized by this image of the world at night. Now, ever since 1543, when Copernicus relegated us from the center of the universe by showing that things made a lot more sense if the Earth was made to orbit the sun, the history of astronomy has been one of continuous relegation. We now recognize that the sun is a very ordinary star amongst stars, not particularly bright, that it lives on the edge and orbits around a very ordinary galaxy that is part of a rather small cluster of galaxies on the edge of much larger clusters of galaxies. And in fact, it's come to the point where you might say um, the Copernican principle prevails, and if in astronomy, I come up with some idea, some theory that um, means that we live in a special place or at a special time or I have to plead special circumstances for my idea to work, then um, we tend to um, think of Occam's razor and think that that is um, not plausible. But what I want to do now, uh, uh, fairly briefly, is to review um, the situation with our Earth and our solar system and just suggests to you that maybe it, it's a little bit more special than we might think. Now, I think I should have pointed out that in this lecture I, can, I am not going to come to some hard and fast conclusion. That would be incredibly arrogant and foolish. What I want to do is lay ideas in front of you to give you a perspective from which you can Think of these things uh, for yourself. Okay, our sun is a stable star halfway through its life. It's got another 5,000 million years to go or so, maybe a bit longer. Now, about 16% of all the stars are what we call F and G stars, stars like the sun, reasonably stable with a reasonably long life. And, but one of the things that Kepler discovered, you'll see some lovely sunspots there, that is showing the sun is active, it gives flares, it gives us aurora and solar winds, that amongst stars of its type, the, our sun seems to be um, particularly, um, uh, 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 what's the word, particularly stable. It doesn't seem to um, change very much. Now, something else that uh, Didier Kellos pointed out when he gave his talk um, on this topic is he looked at the distribution of stars in this diagram here. And um, these are what are called hot Jupiters. Uh, there we are, that's where the Earth is. So inside the Earth's orbit, it gets hotter and hotter. Hot Jupiters, cool Jupiters, and but the majority of stars with planets appear to lie 50 to 80 percent in this region here, more massive than the Earth, much closer to the Sun than the Earth. Now, it's possible that this um, body of Jupiters here is Jupiter, and it's at the bottom end of this distribution. This might be this 10 to 50 percent, and we don't, you know, we're, we're still filling in the observational things here, the, these stars may be uh, indicative of a solar system like ours. You see our planets here, uh, the only one that pops above the observ ob observational line is Jupiter. And what this is telling us is that if these are solar systems like our own, then they're certainly not in the majority. So the majority of planets 
or solar systems are not like our solar system. And that is, um, well, perhaps another of those, um, you know, unexpected things. Um, so that when not all systems are the same. So again, this makes us slightly uh, more special, if you like. Now, it's possible that every solar system, like ours, has a planet more or less at the right distance for the, from the sun, where water will be somewhere between, um, you know, where water will be liquid. But it, that's not good enough. You need to have the right mass. If the Earth's mass was much less than it is, then it's possible the core would have already cooled, and the magnetic field would have gone, and with what with that and the lack of gravity, we would have lost our outer atmosphere. If the Earth was more massive, it's possible that um, uh, we would have retained far more water, um, we might have had far more um, hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere, it, we might not have had um, dry land and things like that. So the mass of the Earth is in itself uh, fairly critical, though we don't know what the limits are. We can see what happened to Venus and, and Mars on either side of us, and the situation on either side is fairly catastrophic one way or the other. So the mass is as important as the position. Now there is something else rather strange about the Earth uh, within our solar system, and that is that it has a moon um, that is about the size, typically the size, of the moons of Jupiter. And Jupiter is 300 times more massive than the Earth. So in relation to our Earth, we have rather a massive moon. And the general idea is that moon was probably created uh, by an impact of a planet, perhaps a planet like Mars, early in the history of the solar system. So what, you might say? Well, it was hypothesized that maybe only planets with moons would develop moons like ours, and, and it was put differently, it was put better than that. It was put only planets where you had total eclipses of the sun would develop civilizations. Well, sounds very involved, but what did that mean? It just meant that our moon is sufficiently massive and big enough to give us a total eclipse that it regulates uh, or damps down the variation in the, oopsie, forgot to use the pointer again, on the, um, uh, of the axis of its rotation. The axis of rotation of the Earth only varies by plus or minus one and a half degrees on a sort of 40,000 year time scale. But even that tiny variation in um, or a a axis orientation has been enough in the last uh, million years or so to trigger recurrent ice ages. So even this small effect has uh, triggered ice ages. Uh, Mars, um, which doesn't have a massive moon, but its inclination varies by plus or minus 15 degrees. Now that would give, if our Earth's axis varied up to plus or minus 15 degrees from time to time, it could be um, as big as 15 degrees, this would give us very dramatic um, differences in climate, which may not have stopped life developing, but may well have stopped advanced life developing. Why does it vary? It's the effect of the gravitational pull of the other uh, planets in our solar system. So here we are just looking at things that make the the, um, the sun, uh, uh, the solar system, our solar system, perhaps a little bit more unusual than we might think. Now we go back to um, uh, July 1994 when we uh, witnessed the impact of a, a comet with Jupiter. And here we see a series of pictures um, taken of the impact. I think this was taken from the Galileo mission, which was on its way um, to Jupiter, and you see the fireball, I think, more catching the sunlight here as it rose above this, the surface of Jupiter's atmosphere. Now, we believe that the process of evolution on Earth is not a sort of steady, continuous process, but a process of what we call punctuated equilibria. 
And we will see that in the geological record there are occasional catastrophes that vastly um, wipe out maybe 90% of species, 90% of living organisms on the surface of the Earth, leaving isolated pockets of organisms that then evolve rapidly to reoccupy the ecological niches next to them. So in order to do that, we, may be, we need a few catastrophes, but not too many. And there's no doubt that Jupiter has a regulating effect of regulating the inflow of large cometary bodies into the inner solar system. So maybe Jupiter is also, having Jupiter just where it is, is also important for us. Now, the other thing, and um, this, I just have to give a tiny bit of background here. This is a measure of the amount, you could say, if you like, it's the amount of iron that there is um, in the Earth, in the solar system. And iron, uh, it's a proxy for all the elements in this room, and all the elements in this room were made in stars after the Big Bang. So the bottom line is um, that iron and all the other elements slowly build up. And this is a histogram showing the number of stars that have planets in relation to the amount of iron they have. And what it is saying is that below a certain value, this is minus one means a tenth of the amount of iron in the sun. Um, this is a logarithmic scale. Um, below a certain value, the stars don't seem to have planets. Well, you might say that's intuitively right. If there isn't heavy element stuff, there's nothing to make planets with. So what does this mean in practice? It means the universe has to run for quite a while before there are enough heavy elements to make planets. So in other words, maybe here we are, um, well, uh, we're about 14,000 million years since the start of the Big Bang. Um, it's, uh, our sun was made about 9,000 million years ago. And so all the elements that were made had to be made uh, before then. And so maybe um, the potential for civilizations is something, and, and life is something fairly recent. And lastly, we live in, we live, as we've said, towards the edge of our galaxy. This is not our galaxy, it's one like us. It's actually the Andromeda Nebula. On the scale of the Andromeda Nebula, we live out here somewhere, in the relatively safe zone. What do I mean by that? Not too many, um, supernovae going off, not too many interactions with giant molecular clouds. We go around, we don't go around as fast as we would in the center here. So giant molecular clouds could mean lots of impacting comets and so on. So this is a fairly quiet zone, a place where we live. So all in all, um, there are a number of things that seem to make our um, solar system and perhaps our Earth a little bit more unusual than you might think. And of course, what I want you to think here is, you're, you're, you're thinking about, we know here we are sitting in this room, we have a civilization, we communicate and so on, we do stuff. How did we get here? Is it inevitable that every planet that can develop life will follow a trajectory that ends up with something like we have here? So now I want to just look at the origin of the um, solar system, at the origin of the Earth, and uh, the development of life. And we start off on the grand scale. I've already alluded to this. This is all the time in the universe. Here's the Big Bang. Um, and here we are today. Well, 4,500 million years ago, that is um, in the last third of the lifetime of the universe, our sun and solar system were born, and they were essentially, apart from the hydrogen and helium, our Earth and us were born out of this stuff here, this rock. It's a carbonaceous chondrite, got a lot of carbon in it, which is why it looks dark. It has all the elements in the periodic table in them, apart from the gases, and this is the stuff. This is the sine qua non of everything in this room, including ourselves, the stuff that was there, the stuff that had been created by 
all the stars that had been born and died in the first, you know, uh, 6,700 million years or so of the history of the, um, of the universe. So let us now look at the last 4,500 million years. And um, here is, this is, this is um, an astronomer's view on the origin of life with the arrogance of an astronomer going to put it all on one slide. And um, basically, we see the formation of the sun and planets, including that piece of rock, about 4,500 million years ago. Now, there were various events um, that occurred, including the late heavy bombardment, which some people now argue about, but the late heavy bombardment is what gave all the cratering on the Earth, on the Moon, and would have done the same, only much more so on Earth, uh, and would have perhaps almost reliquified the surface, although we now believe not entirely. But when we look at the, uh, at the record, the oldest rocks we uh, see on Earth are about 3,800 million years old. And then, almost immediately, we see the earliest um, traces of life. And we see these uh, stromalites in the fossil record. Um, and here we see modern stromalites, I think in Australia. They're sort of mats of of uh, bacteria, some sort of bacteria, matting sand together, and um, we see evidence for life. So this is mystery number one. It appears that life, seems that life appeared on Earth almost as soon as it was possible for life to emerge. Now, um, and the mystery is, how did that life form? Where did it come from? Did it form spontaneously here? Was it brought um, into the, um, onto the Earth from elsewhere? And we can imagine from elsewhere, perhaps, in the solar system. Now, we see today, we think that there are three domains of life, archaea, uh, bacteria, and the archaea we've alluded to. Um, they are uh, single-celled organisms, look a bit like bacteria, bacteria, and then structured cells, or eukaryotes. So, um, the... The big mystery, and mystery number one, is how and where did life form? You might say mystery number two is how was it that for the next 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 500 million years or so, there was nothing but single-celled organisms uh, on Earth? And then, a mere 600 million years ago, there was a huge sudden uh, development of multicelled organisms, the precursors of all life that we see around us today. Now, something important did take place. We went from archaea and, and bacteria to these structured cells or eukaryotes. And uh, I would have said, I mean, uh, in the past, what we see here is we see inclusions, mitochondria that have their own DNA and their own cell lines, and we see the other cellular material in the nucleus. Now, some people recently are arguing that this, these cells arose not from these things merging, but from something amongst the archaea merging. So there's a lot of discussion about the pathways for the origin of life that is, is beyond, way outside my own scope of being able to uh, relate. But what was also happening here was there was a steady build-up in oxygen, the amount of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. And it is possible that this sudden proliferation of multicell life took place at a point where the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere was sufficient that if you had a spontaneous clustering of cells, which you would have done just from atomic forces, just from surface tension, um, you, you would find there was enough oxygen that oxygen could diffuse in and the cells inside the cluster could go on living, whereas if that had happened earlier on, the cells would have died. Anyway, this is, again, this is a brief history of life on Earth, and again, you have to ask yourself, is this an inevitable trajectory, or is it um, something rather unusual and unique? 
So we might travel around the, the universe and find Earths just like our own, just as perfectly formed with all the same parameters and all it might be, no plants, no trees, no animals, just a soup the seas with bacteria in it, um, because that's how the Earth has spent most of its life up to now. Now, the last 600 million years, we see the first multicelled creatures, land animals, plants, and so on, the merging of continents, and we come up to today. And you will see here some red lines, and these red lines correspond to five great extinctions in the history of the development of life on Earth. And in fact, you will see a thinner red line, and I think I can probably remove the question mark. This is, we are now seeing the disappearance of species that in the future will look like another great mass extinction, and we know who was responsible for that. If we, or who is responsible for that. If we wind back to 65 million years ago, we have a pretty good idea what it was that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and allowed for the mammals to proliferate and, if you like, take over from the dinosaurs. And we know there was a major cometary impact. We also know that around about that time, there was also a major outpouring of uh, catastrophic volcanic activity, the Deccan Traps, as they're called, which are seen in India, vast, cu vast cubic kilometers of, of um, magma pouring over the surface of the land. Now, we don't know what the causes of these other extinctions were, um, we know that there were ice ages. There was an ice age just before this point of proliferation here. And we think the possible reasons I put here, volcanoes, climate change, ice ages. Here are some ice ages. Uh, it may have been that we were entering, about to enter a major ice age um, until we got cracking with climate change. We're not sure. Um, comet impacts and continental drift. And I suspect that a lot of these catastrophes were a combination of these. If the continents are in certain alignment, then um, catastrophe may occur in a way it wouldn't if they were spread out in different ways. But anyway, it looks as though, again, this idea of punctuated equilibrium, that we essentially needed these events to drive evolution, but we didn't need too many of them. Now, let us look at the last 7,000 million years. And again, I keep reminding you, you must ask yourself, is it always this way? Uh, is there an inevitability? Now, we think um, that about 7 million years ago, we had a last common ancestor with the chimpanzees that are around today, that they and us had a common ancestor. Some people um, reckon that this event may have only been, whoopsie, may have only been about 4,500 million years ago. Now, I'm sure anybody who, who begins to follow any of this will, will recognize some of these names, the vast variety of names of hominids, hominins that have occurred and been found here, there, and everywhere, mainly, of course, in Africa. I think all of these in Africa. And um, these have been classified by Rubidge here into Australopithecus, and these were um, put together as being uh, homo, homo, um, a, a different group. And we go through these uh, found in Africa, and then we get up to um, the more recent homos, hominins here, and um, we go to these, we see ourselves, homo sapiens uh, up here, and we'll come to some of these other things. Now, when we look at the archaeological record, we see an event that occurred about 800,000 years ago. That seems to be the discovery of cooking, the ability to use fire to process proteins to make them more accessible, make them digestible with much less energy. 
And this seems to have allowed the development, when we look at the archaeological record, of the expansion of the human brain. And then we come to this rather contentious idea, this idea of the emergence of mind. Now, mind and thoughtfulness is something that, um, that Darwin thought about. He thought the difference between humans and animals was one of degree, not of kind. In other words, dogs are pretty smart, we're just a bit smarter. It was, it was along those lines. Whereas this fellow, Mark Hauser, who I take as an example, he disagrees. He believes that there was something fundamentally different, this emergence of mind. And I'll just briefly define what that is. Now, when I started my archaeological interests, it was all about intelligence and tool making. The definition of modern man was the ability to make tools. But here we have Betty the Crow. And Betty lived in a lab in uh, Oxford. And she was a tool user. She had a challenge. She had a bucket with some meat in it, and which she wished to retrieve from the bottom of this glass vial. And um, so she didn't just take a bit of wire with a hook in it. She actually made the hook and used the hook to retrieve the bucket. Now, COVIDs and humans are, are I don't know, um, probably 100 million or more years apart from having a common ancestor. So it looks as though intelligence emerges where it's needed. And the difference between intelligence and mind, and this issue of mind is clearly very important if we're thinking about where we get to today. Animals can solve problems, can exhibit social behavior, uh, even object to unfair food distribution, and certainly use tools, as we've just seen. But humans do something different. Generative computation, he called it. Variety of combination of words, notes, mathematical symbols. Variety of ideas, the um, moral values, and so on. Using mental symbols to encode sensory, real, and imagined experiences and exhibit abstract thought. Think about uniforms, uh, unicorns. Think about uh, the universe and God. And these are unique products of mind. And so it's not clear what this is, but um, clearly it is um, a very important. It seems to be something that may have suddenly occurred, that we don't think mind exists in the same set. Well, clearly, Chimps and so on don't exhibit um, those characteristics that I just described. So now let us look at the last 100,000 years uh, in, in, indicated in here. And you will see the very interesting uh, of fact here, Homo sapiens, that's us. But you will see within the last 100,000 years, we seem to have shared with other hominids Denisovans and Neanderthals, Neanderthals in Europe, Denisovans in the Middle East, and um, the, um, we seem to, and these um, Heidelberg man as well, which is thought um, was a, a precursor uh, of, um, a, from an earlier branching. There seems to have been a branching from a common ancestor here um, that uh, split up perhaps sub. Uh, previous migrations out of Africa, and so that for a while we coexisted with these. And it's even thought that, um, uh, I keep forgetting the name of this particular um, hominid, I obviously left it off the diagram, which was rather foolish, um, Australopithecus, I think we call them, Australopithecines, yeah. And they're on um, a flores, a lake, near uh, um, uh, 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 an island near Borneo, there are what appear to be remains of uh, an Australopithecine that lived perhaps, perhaps as recently as 18,000 years ago. So let us look at the last 100,000 years. And again, what you have to say when you look at this diagram, is it inevitable 100,000 years ago here we see the earliest examples of ochre being ground in a shell here. Was it inevitable that in a geological flash of time, we would be visiting the moon? 
And I have to underpin this by pointing out that this was the last warm period, that this era here till about 18,000 years ago was during the last ice age. And here are just a few um, stepping stones, this carved ochre from southern Africa. These artifacts are all from the same cave, in fact. And then this uh, painting, which is some of the earliest um, that we see, I think, again in Indonesia. And we think modern humans, that's us, left Africa round about here and entered um, into the Middle East and moved uh, around the world from there, entered Europe round about here and coexisted with Neanderthals. And we, in fact, have Neanderthal genes maybe 2% or more. People in the Far East have similar genetic connections with Denisovans. So here we have the end of the Ice Age, first cities, Stonehenge, Norman invasion, and we visit the moon. Okay, and here we are with our technological advances. So is that an inevitable trajectory? I must say, and, and there are many other things that we could point out. The Greeks didn't build, well, they did build sort of steam engines to open doors and so on. How inevitable was technology? From what point was it inevitable? If anywhere, we'd be where we are. So what about life? And we'll come on to intelligent life. I'm going to overrun a bit. I was given permission to do that. Um, I'm very optimistic that we'll find life somewhere else in our solar system. And this is the um, area. This is the Jezero crater. And here we have a stream run or river system that ran into the Jezero crater. And you will see a delta an ancient delta that's probably billions of years old. We believe this was full, this was a kind of sea, and currently Perseverance, the Perseverance rover is exploring, and you'll see here's the edge of the delta. And this is where Perseverance is exploring and looking for evidence for life. And it says yesterday, the 12th of June, I know it was just there because it took this picture of the sediments. And what we're looking at here are the sediments. You can see typical floodplain sediments. Uh, we can see this wonderful cross bedding that was at the edge of somewhere where material was falling forward, if you like, and then um, the more um, with the, the, the horizontal beds above it. And Perseverance will be sampling these rocks to bring these rocks back um, to um, Earth with a return mission. So that's where it was yesterday. That's what it's busy doing right now. My bed for life uh, would be uh, maybe in Europa or Ganymede. Um, here we have seas below the surface. We have a magnetic field, which suggests the presence of a hot core with the presence of smokers. And um, here we have the, the ice covering of, um, uh, of Europa. So, and we can go even further afield to Saturn, and here we see Enceladus in the middle there, which has these jets of water vapor emerging from the base, even though the temperatures are maybe only 70 degrees or less above absolute zero out at this place. The gravitational squeezing of Saturn is heating up the interior of this, this um, moon, and... Um, Jets of steam are coming out. Where there is liquid water, there is the possibility for life. And maybe the possibility for even more exotic life on Titan here. This is a sea of methane and ethane at temperatures of minus 180 or so. So we have many possible places where there might be life within our solar system. We have the building blocks of life in comets. We have a way of moving life from planet to planet. This is a meteorite struck off the surface of Mars that spent, I think, 16 million years or so in orbit around the sun before it crashed into the Earth about in 1911 or so. And we've shown that bacteria can withstand the accelerations of a piece of rock being knocked off by an impact. Now, if we're going to find life on any of the planets around us, we need to observe their spectra. Back in 2007, uh, which is now abandoned, was a project to launch an enormous 
um, several hundred meter diameter, effectively, telescope into space that would have been able to use interferometry um, that this is if from 30 light years, this is what our solar system would have looked like. Interferometry will allow us to cancel out the light of the sun and we can see the light of some of the planets. If we can see the light, we can get a spectrum. That was cancelled, but this project has not been cancelled. This is called the New Worlds Mission, and the idea is to launch a mask with this particular shape, which cancels out the bright spot due to the star, that if you have a diffracting uh, disk and you block out a light, you will get um, interference, waves coming around it, you'll see a bright spot. This will cancel this. So the idea is you have the James Webb 72,000 kilometers in front, you have this thing blocking out the direct light of a star, enabling you to observe the planet. And if you can observe the planet, then you can see the uh, out of equilibrium molecules um, and things like oxygen, ozone here, that will um, tell you that maybe you're looking at a place where there's light, life. Now, of course, we want to know about intelligent life. And I'm sure you all remember the SETI project that ran 20 million uh, no, no, two million years of CPU time worldwide, scanned the thr sky three times and found nothing. The SETI project continues. That telescope you just saw has collapsed, but um, there is now a SETI institute that has its own radio telescopes that are devoted full time, these 42 uh, six meter antennae, and they're forever updating the, um, the, the detectors. And all new radio telescopes, including this proposed square kilometer array and Meerkat, which is already built, this thing already exists in South Africa, all have a proportion of their time spent on searches for civilization, searches for signals. But in recent years, we've come to realize that perhaps the most effective way of communicating is with lasers. And in fact, if we took the world's most powerful laser, which is used for nuclear fusion result, uh, research, coupled it to one of today's telescopes, and used one of today's telescopes, this is the, um, what is it, the Keck, uh, 10 meter telescope, uh, with today's photometers, we would be able to detect a signal from one of these lasers a thousand light years away as a pulse. There you are. We'd get a thousand photons in 10 to the nine, minus nine seconds um, of from this 10 to the 15 watt pulsing thing. Now, a thousand light years um, doesn't look very far in the scheme of the galaxy, but it does include quite a, a few um, stars. I should have said the square kilometer array reckons that they will be able to t detect airport radar used for bringing planes in out to about 10 light years. So that is just a, a signal leaking away from Earth. Now there have been uh, attempts um, for, to look for pulses. Um, these have been running, well, they've, most, they've all stopped now uh, for 20 years or so, never detected anything, just uh, looking for pulses. But at the moment, the SETI Institute is in the process of developing these double cameras um, that have the uh, chips orientated in different ways um, with a 75 degree wide field that will stare at the sky. They use a rather ingenious way. Uh, they assume that if somebody's transmitting, they will be using a laser. So they have a diffraction grating, um, transmission grating below the lens that turns all the star spectra into a little band but if there's a laser pulse, it will look like a bright spot. We have a pair of cameras so that uh, the cosmic rays can be canceled out, which um, upset the CCDs. These will be put around the um, world at various observatories and we'll look for these laser um, uh, signals, if there are any. Um, and this is a project that, um, and interestingly, is being crowdfunded, and they have about 200,000 out of $500,000 to fund it. So why is it silent? Now, there are all kinds of reasons why it might be silent. Um, the, the first is we may be the first to achieve technological e 
excellence. We're not listening in the right way. They choose not to communicate. Maybe organic intelligence, that's what we have, is short-lived. And maybe technological civilization is short-lived. And maybe we are alone. Now, I don't have time to go over all those. So I'm just going to say something briefly. This is something that Martin Rees is quite keen on the idea that organic intelligence is superseded by machine intelligence. And he thinks that this, once this happens, of course, um, maybe our imperative to search for life, our leaking, filling the world with signals and radio emission uh, will cease. And in fact, if you think about it, we do so much communication by lasers, by undersaw optical fibers, that you can well imagine a situation where the radio signals, with perhaps the exception of airport radar, um, die away from the surface of the Earth. So it could be that we evolve into something different quite soon. The other technological civilization is short-lived. Now, I want to, don't worry, uh, we've got an equation, uh, but this is just something I show this because this is the way uh, the Drake equation, Frank Drake formulated this in 1960. He tried to um, decide how many civilizations there would be. It's called a rate equation, and it just says the average rate of starbirth, and then the fraction, these are fractions essentially of uh, stars with planets, planets, um, a number of habitable planets, fraction of planets on which life arises, fraction that evolve intelligent life, fraction which choose to communicate. Um, that's always fraction. It's between one and zero. And then the lifetime. So very simple equation, the simplest of ideas, something that has been sneered at. Um, we just changed the form of the equation from the rate equation to just expressing the lifetime of a civilization in terms of the lifetime of a star. And then we just look at the numbers that we think we know. We do know, we, uh, we can make an estimate, the number of stars in our galaxy, 100,000 million. Fraction of stars with planets. Well, I did a little sum, which I checked, um, uh, with the latest discovery of planets. And this is a fairly optimistic number, I may say. Um, the fraction that have um, radii between 0.8 and 1.25, that of the Earth. And we can say the lifetime of a star like the sun is, is 10,000 million years. So we can just do some, those blue numbers turn into 0.2 there. So essentially, we're left with these number of habitable planets. We set all these numbers to one. So every um, star has a planet that is habitable, life arises, intelligent life arises, and they communicate. So all those numbers are one. So uh, one, one, one here. We, so we're left with how long a civilization lasts. And if it lasts a million years, then there'll be 200,000 of them around. If it only lasts 100 years, then, and I'm talking about technological advance, then there'd only be 20. And this seems to be already a bit worrying. If we set these numbers to one in 10, number of habitable stars, and, and you could change the numbers around. You might leave this as one and make this one in 100. Fraction of life arising, intelligent life, one in 10 of all these, then just multiplying those numbers together. If a civilization lasts a million years, there'd only be 20. Or in other words, for there to be one, a civilization has to last at least 50,000 years. Or to put it another way, on average in our galaxy, a civilization will emerge once every 50,000 years. Now, our civilization, if you put the Chinese into it, has been about 5,000 years. And uh, if you say, how long have we been technologically advanced enough to communicate? Well, it's just about 100 years since the, and even then, 100 years ago, radio wouldn't have got anywhere significant. So I would suggest that if, um, that if we are to hope to live for 50,000 years as an intelligent civilization, we will have a lot of threats to um, overcome, 
and I suspect, I've, I'm not going to go through all these, um, I suspect the greatest threat um, is ourselves. And I would hypothesize that the reason it is silent out there is because technological civilizations are not stable. Right, I'm going to wind up very quickly now and just um, take the, well, the optimistic pessimist view or the pessimistic optimist view. Okay, so let us assume that we, every, we um, wipe out life on Earth. So what happens? Here is the future of the um, life of the history of the Earth. The, um, you can see the oceans start to evaporate. The Earth falls into the sun in about 7,000 uh, million years' time. But even before the oceans start to evaporate, if we wipe out every multi-celled organism on Earth, um, then where do we go? We jump back 600 million years. Uh, we know we've got all those single-celled organisms, so we could perhaps have another two goes uh, before the oceans are too warm, to, or before the water just disappears. So, you know, we destroy everything, we set back history another 600 million years, well, we've got time to do that, um, and we'll be okay. Now, let us um, be a bit more, um, how can I say, optimistic and realize that to, with today's technology, um, that is, you know, rockets that we can launch and build, we could, although we're never going to do this, we could cross the galaxy at the Earth's escape velocity, which we can achieve, in, well, just over a thousand million years. So, in other words, on this time scale, with today's technology, we could visit every single star in the galaxy, so we could find somewhere uh, to live. Now, of course, this all seems highly implausible, and in a sense it is, and nobody is, is thinking of building a spacecraft to go off and explore the rest of the universe. But it, it's not just fantasy, it is something that we can conceive, and we could, if we put huge resources, build a self-sustaining vehicle that might disappear out into the, into the universe and who knows what it might find. Now, the reality is likely to be a little bit more um, depressing than that. Um, it is argued that the, big, the real fate of the Earth will come in about 600 million years or so. In fact, what I, I didn't explain because it's not part of the talk is the sun is getting um, more and more luminous and it's probably th it's about 30% more luminous today than it was when the solar system was formed. And there we are, 30% more luminous. It will continue to do so. The Earth will get hotter. The, oddly enough, the fate of the Earth will be that all carbon dioxide is mopped up in the erosion of rocks by the increased heating, the increased effects of carbonic acid. And the Earth, uh, life on Earth will end with um, all the CO2 being taken out, all the plants dying, and all the mammals dying, perhaps in a shorter 600 million years. So, are we the most complex beings in the universe? Uh, uh, that's a question. If there are others, will ours last long enough to see them? And if we're the only thinking, self-aware beings, is it important that we survive? And I'll just leave you um, with this last quote from Haldane. I have no doubt that in reality the future will be vastly more surprising than anything I can imagine. That's J.B. Haldane in 1927. Now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Robin, that was fantastic. Um, for the people on Zoom, if you can type any questions you have into Q&A, um, not into chat, because the tablet I'm holding is only showing the Q&A window. Um, people in person, if you can wave at one of the microphones and they will come to you. Everyone's looking quiet at yeah, the moment. Come on, guys, Who's questions. I demand a question. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Uh, you did mention uh, in the early part of your talk that 
uh, life might not be just carbon-based, but silicon-based. Could you expand on that, please? Um, well, unfortunately, not really, but um, there are other silicon is capable of forming multiple bonds like carbon does. And so it's possible, and it's and what I do remember about this is that those silicon um, uh, molecules, and one should think silicon putty, as I said, rather, you know, the, rather than uh, the rocks, um, would be quite unstable at our room temperature, but might be stable in an environment that you might find uh, in somewhere like Titan. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's not anything as far as I know that anybody's explored, but it is just based on the idea that you can string um, silicon atoms together in the way that you can string carbon atoms together. We've got a question from Paul Klein online. Um, sorry, possibly from Janet. It's not quite clear who it's from. Yeah. Um, the science fiction writer A. E. Van Vogt, in his novel *The Voyage of the Space Beagle*, describes beings made of light. Ah, oh, well, there you are. I'm I'm a boring old astronomer and physicist, and I I might conceive beings made of silicon, um, but light, no, light isn't um, a kind of thing that builds stuff. It's um, a, um, it's a way of moving energy around, essentially. A photon. So no, I don't think that's plausible. But maybe anything's plausible in science fiction. <laughs> yes. Ah. Yep. Tim. Yeah. So with the radio velocity method of uh, detecting planets, sorry. how are we uh, determining the 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 component that is due to the planet being? in our plane and, and the component that's due to it being perpendicular. In, in other words, are we only seeing a minimum um, level for it? We are. We, um, we talk about the, the mass, but we should talk about m, the mass, times sine i, the, the, the trigonometric function, of the inclination. So um, when we make the raw, radio velocity measurement, we don't know whether we're looking at a highly inclined orbit, um, I'll do it like that towards you, or one in the plane. And clearly, if it's highly inclined, we're only seeing a small component of its orbital velocity, and therefore it'd be more massive. Now, if we can observe, if we observe planets in transit, uh, in other words, one moving in front of the other, then the the values of I, inclination, are pretty restricted. Um, otherwise, the planet misses the star. So if we can get um, the mass from the radio velocity and we can get the transit, we can get, um, we know what sine I is. So then we can get the masses from the periods and the, the, the orbital time and the velocity and the integral of the velocity gives us the circumference. So then we can get the radius, and we know the period, and that all comes out of Newton, so you can get the mass. Yeah. Okay, we have another one online. You were talking about um, what if life is very rare. Um, Akul Dewan asks, are there implications if we find out to a reasonable degree that life in the universe is rare? Well, I think there are ph philosophical implications. If we find that life is rare, um, I, I just pose that question. When you think of the vastness and the complexity of the universe, I mean, I've sometimes had this image of um, 60 million years ago, 65, 70 million years ago, all those beautiful beaches and wonderful environments with dinosaurs wandering around, and somehow you feel something or somebody should have been there to appreciate them. Um, maybe this is a very human view, I don't know. Um, so I think the implications are philosophical, and that's outside my pay grade, as they say. <laughs> yeah. You see how you was talking about communicating with aliens. Is there any other way that you would suggest to communicate with them? 
Well, that's a very good question. And I've certainly given this, this talk to audiences um, uh, with, uh, I think, um, literary people and who have felt it's quite, it would be quite impossible to communicate. And what I think is that it would be, it's very unlikely we'll ever be able to share poetry. But the one thing that we all, anybody who lives in this universe has in common, are the laws of physics, the laws of nature. And I suspect it may be, and, and probably mathematics, and so I suspect it would be possible to start sharing information at some level, maybe sharing images. You can imagine you get a, 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 an array of numbers, you've just got to sort them out and it can turn into a picture, that we would have this common language of shared knowledge of Newton's law, shared knowledge of maybe distant pulsars. We'd all observe the same thing. So I think I'm optimistic that we could start a dialogue or we could encode information that somebody else could read and interpret. But I think, yeah, to, to share poetry is very unlikely. Whether we could share music, I don't know. Um, that would be an interesting thought. Yes. Hi, Robin, thank you. Uh, assume the technology advanced civilization, they have uh, AI robots, which doesn't like water, they can live in extreme temperature. So that, certainly we're not in that civilization yet. Assume that that civilization ever existed. So the sole purpose of those robots, they just go to different planets and build up the manufacturing capacity of a semiconductor, metal, steel, uh, copper, and then build more and more robots and sending them through more and more galaxies. If that were the case, that civilization can survive longer than 100 a million years. So shouldn't we be able to see some evidence of that super, super technology advanced civilization? Well, that, that is, you, you state, it's sometimes called the Fermi paradox, um, that, you know, the universe is 14,000 million years ago. Okay, I made a case that it may be only in the last, but plus or minus a thousand million years, that civilizations could develop. So why is it silent out there? Why do we see no evidence? Now, that is the state of play at the moment. We see no, no evidence for any kind of intelligent activity. Now, we're still looking, and we're going to go on looking, and we're listening, and we're hopeful. But um, the bottom line is, it's still silent. Now, you can think of all kinds of reasons why it might be. People might feel it's important to hide their presence um, beyond a certain point. Um, who knows? But it is silent, so that is the paradox. Why is it silent? And I've suggested tonight, maybe it's silent because technological civilizations don't last long enough. Could be full of Greek civilizations or any other, you know, Chinese civilization. Um, could be brimming with them, and we will never know because we'll never be able to detect them. So would that be proof AI has never been created in the entire history? Like general AI has never been created, or is that proof general AI can never be created? No, I don't think it can never be. I think we just see it the way it is now. Um, and we may be wrong. We're hopeful. That's why we keep going on with all the radio telescopes and so on. They all have a bit of searching built into their programs because we all want to give it a chance. I'm going to take a question from, because it links into that, from Professor Daniel Broby. He said, there has been some discussion recently about artificial intelligence and the evolution to a singularity between humans and machines. So recently Google's Lambda application, a language model for dialogue, has been in the news with the suggestions that it might be sentient. Is this just the next step in evolution or is it a distraction? I think that's a very difficult question to answer. And I would return it with, I think, which is a well-known concept, that as I stand here, I'm pretty, I know that I am self-aware and conscious. But I don't know that you aren't all a simulation. I mean, because you could be. And I could be the only sentient, self-aware being here. I mean, there are good reasons for thinking otherwise, but as we get more and more into artificial realities and so on, I think we become 
it's clear you can become completely involved in those. So I think this, this idea of where sentience emerges um, and what it is, is, is something that, um, well, I, th I think we're a long way from deciding. So I would I, I'd say the answer is, I don't know. I think we have to think about these things, but it'll probably be just a distraction. Yeah. <laughs> You've sort of already answered my question, but in your education and experience, are you, are you still hopeful that we will stumble across signs of life are you, in our lifetimes? Oh yes, I'm very hopeful. I mean, I think, I th I think uh, even possibly in my lifetime, we, will know, we might detect life somewhere else in the solar system. And what would be really exciting is if it was fundamentally different from life on our life, the, the, you know, the basic structure of our DNA or something. But it'll probably turn out to be the same. And then we'll all say, oh, I told you so, you can move life around. But I did read somewhere, I think, and this, that um, somebody has done some experiments with something like DNA by putting an extra molecule in so that you can you can end up with a stable structure but it's it's got quite a different you know it's got an extra something or other um, amino acid in um, so I don't know where those sort of experiments might lead but yeah I'm, I'm optimistic we'll find life simple life single organism life somewhere in the solar system um, soon I hope yeah in my lifetime and certainly in yours. Life elsewhere, I don't know. No. So I think that's a positive note on which we should move to the bar. Oh, okay, so good. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, as I said, this is probably the last um, talk for a, a few months. Um, our next scheduled talk, I think, is 17th of October. And that's going to be on um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, like I said, if you want to keep up to date with the talks, hopefully soon visits as well, and other events that we're holding, um, please you know, either follow us on Eventbrite or like us on Facebook, or if you really like us, we really would encourage you to become members because every little bit helps. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you.